All right, and we're recording. So welcome back to Holly, my friend. And the last time we had Holly on Coffee Chat, which is what this is, Holly was talking to us about uh, fandom and fan cultures. And uh, we had a really great, really long discussion on that. <laughs> um, not what we're talking about this time. We, this time, are talking about the thing that Holly does to make money that feeds her. <laughs> yes. And that is her job. <laughs> And Holly is a sign language interpreter. Specifically, she's a sign language, sign language interpreter in American Sign Language, which <laughs> is the signed language that is most used, I believe, um, by deaf people in the United States and Canada. There are other signed languages used in those two countries, but predominantly ASL is the one that nowadays is used more. Um, I bet Holly might tell us a little bit about the history of it and, and things sort of like the difference between uh, ASL and C, which is signed exact English, which mm -hmm. is still used, but it is not nearly as popular today, if I'm understanding correctly. Yes. Um, so I'm going to, what I would ask you to do, Holly, is to give us kind of a, an introduction into why you wanted to become a sign language interpreter how you got there, how long you've been doing it, and what does the job even entail? You know, is it is it just as straightforward as it sounds, or is there surprising elements to it? Yeah, of course. So I very first learned sign language when I was a child. Um, there was a little girl in my class who was deaf um, and was unfortunately bullied quite frequently because she was deaf in our class. Um, and I was born quite premature and had a lot of mobility issues myself and was also bullied quite heavily because kids are just really mean. Um, and so I wrote her a note one day and was like, hey, <laughs> want to be friends question mark how do I talk to you <laughs> and so she wrote back oh like learn how to spell and so I went home that night and I was like mom I need to learn how to spell with my hands and she was like what on why <laughs> and so my very patient amazing mother taught me how to finger spell like she we pulled up something on a computer or she had like maybe in a back of a, a book somewhere like had the alphabet so like we sat down together and she, I memorized the language or the not the language the alphabet over the next like day or two so I went back the next day and I was like okay hi my name is Holly except like so much slower than that because I had no clue what I was doing and she was very sweet and signed back and told me her name was Cheyenne and we started learning I started learning sign language and we became pretty decent friends um and she eventually ended up moving away to go to an all deaf school which like super awesome um I'm glad she did but we kind of fell out of touch after that around like second grade probably and I stopped signing after that because I had nobody to do it with so well, I forgot an interpreter in her class in the class that you were both in not when we were that young or not that I remember having one okay um I don't think her parents were deaf either to memory so how did she get through those classes then do you know mm, no <laughs> probably <laughs> Which is, so this is the big thing so uh we're jumping around a little bit but interpreters are sometimes the only lifeline for a lot of young deaf children to education and learning so having an interpreter in that class would have made all, having a holly you know an older holly <laughs> in that class to help her would have made all the difference absolutely yeah okay, um so i don't know signing but yeah, quit signing, um, didn't pick it back up until I got into high school. One night, my mother was like, hey, look, there's this show coming on TV. And it's about these kids that were switched at birth. And like, isn't that wild? And my mother is, is now a nurse. I think she was in nursing school then, but has always been involved in the medical field. And so she got to talking about like the medical, like, oh my gosh, can you imagine what if that were to happen in a hospital? What would you do? And so she asked if I wanted to come watch an episode with her. I don't think either of us had really seen the whole trailer yet or anything. It was just like, that's all she knew about it was like, there was babies and they were switched at birth. And I was like, sure, <laughs> why not? And so then we sat down and that show has quite a few deaf characters with deaf actors and is very sign language focused because one of the children that is switched at birth is deaf. Um, 
And so I was like, oh, wow. And so we got to talking about it. And we're like, oh, do you remember that girl in preschool? Like, da, 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 da. And I was like, you know, I should probably, like, it would be really cool to learn that language again or, like, start seeing if I could pick it back up. So I sat down one night and got on my computer and was like, I, okay, I'm going to see if there is any resources to me in ninth, 10th grade um, that would help me learn sign language because it's not offered at my small rural middle of nowhere town um for school and so i found a website called life print that offered mm. your first 100 lessons and taught you all the vocabulary but also like grammar and deaf culture and deaf history to an extent and stuff like that and i was like well this seems pretty legit so i sat down and started working my way through these lessons and teaching myself and just signing in a mirror and being like man wouldn't it be cool if anybody else knew how to do this <laughs> So <laughs> throughout my high school years, I roped in some of my friends of being like, hey, you guys should learn this with me because then I could actually talk to people using it. It never got very far with many of them, <laughs> but that's okay <laughs> because I kept trying to learn. And then I was in governor's school, which is a program that allows uh kids to graduate with their associate's degree uh, while they graduate from high school at the same time. Oh, wow. um, yeah, very, very, you're in college half the day and then you go back to high school your junior and senior year. And it's a lot of work. It is really intense, but it's a lot of fun. But one of my humanities professor, my English professor did a passion project our senior year, I think maybe it was our junior year. Um, and we were supposed to pick something that we were really passionate about and create like a 10 minute presentation on it, do research. It was supposed to teach us how to do all of the things that would be really useful to know how to do in college, like how to do an annotated bibliography, how to write a paper and then present on it. But it was supposed to be like, you're passionate about this, so you shouldn't mind doing it and it'll also be fun. And I was like, okay. And so I picked sign language on a whim because I it was my passion at the time and I really wanted to tell more people about it. Um, and part of the project was you had to do the presentation and then you had to like, make, create, write, or do something with whatever you were presenting on. And so I decided that I was going to sign a song um, to my class. And I chose uh, Now You're Just Somebody That I Used to Know by Gautye because there is a really amazing version on YouTube that's all children of deaf adults and deaf people themselves that interpreted it. And it's like filmed really theatrically and all this stuff. And so I sat with it for like weeks and <laughs> tried to piece together like what I knew of signs and then just matching what they were doing with their hands and hoping I was doing it right just but ended up the best yeah just gonna go for it but did end up learning how to sign the entire song I signed it for my class um and my English professor came up to me and told me that if I didn't end up doing that with my life in some way shape or form that she would be so upset because she could tell how much joy it brought me oh. um and I was like, oh, okay, you're the only, like, person in my life that's really pushing me towards this, because, like, a lot of the other adults in my life are like, who ever would be an interpreter for sign language for deaf people? I've never heard of this, ever. I don't know a single person in my life that knows sign language, let alone does that for a job. And so a lot of them were like, this isn't going to be a career path for you. There's no money in this. <laughs> Uh, my, uh, I had quite a few people, including my mother, who wanted me to either go into special education and become a teacher for special education or just teaching in general or to become a nurse or work in the medical field in some way, shape or form, because I did enjoy medicine and learning about medicine. Right. Um, I can, so I was getting, I can see both of those. Yeah, I was getting pushed in a couple different directions, but really right. wanted to do this and was stuck because there was no school in Virginia that offered a bachelor's degree in it so that I could go to there was just like I think it excuse me I think it was UVA has a minor in it mm. that you can take and has a decent program um maybe William and Mary had something like there was a couple of the bigger colleges that had like maybe a couple classes and maybe mm. a deaf history but like nothing much and then lo and behold my senior year when I was like actually being like oh crap I have to like actually apply for colleges and stuff now um 
Liberty University announced that they were going to have a bachelor's degree in the program mm. and it was going to be sign language focus was going to have deaf teachers the whole nine yards and I was like oh okay strange weird I don't know a lot about this school but it's the only one in my state that has a bachelor's degree and I can't afford out-of-state tuition so mm-hmm. yeah. yes I'm going <laughs> <laughs> so ended up going to school there got my degree was a whole long arduous process that you were there for most all of that <laughs> and helping spur me on well, so, um, so let's, let's talk about let's let's take a pause here because we both did some sign language study in college i i was mm-hmm. not studying to become an interpreter um but you were and so there was there was some definitely some differences between the two so when i started going to my school in ashland oregon there were i think a 101 102 and 103 course okay and that was it (laughs) and you could take those classes for credits but those credits did absolutely nothing for you they just Mm -hmm. they were there you paid for them Ooh, extra credits right so we had to actually go out and do a petition and i i was one of i think two or three students that we put together a petition that said, okay, so you're offering a language series, but it's not fulfilling your foreign language requirement for graduation. Why not? And so when we got the amount of, and I don't remember the amount of signatures that it required, but they saw the response from the student body. And it wasn't just, you know, people that had an interest in sign language. The theater kids actually were really Mm -hmm. strongly interested in sign language because it's such a physical language. And funnily enough, the... um, the, we got the techies, the theater techies, the kids behind the curtain, they could, they discovered really quickly that they could use sign language to communicate with each other backstage. And yep. so they thought, if I can do something that helps me in my career and gets me my foreign language requirement, this is awesome, I'm sold. So they had no choice but to hire on the, our single deaf professor that we had and mm-hmm. let him do the 201, 202, and 203 series. And then if you took all those, yeah, you get your foreign language requirement. And so what we would do is we would have like a couple of days a week, we would get to have really big classes. Like we we normally at at that school had smaller classes, but these these Uh sign language classes, there would be 20, 30 of us in a class. And you know, and as you went further on, people would drop out and it became kind of right students because at some point it goes, oh, this is too hard for me. I no longer care. (laughs) <laughs> they were all held in like a basement in this dungy little area where there was no right light. it was just all the fluorescence and you would spend it was it was like a two-hour class and so you really kind of dug deep into it but that was kind of I mean it was it was something that was kind of you know okay I guess you guys want this so we're kind of throwing it away and and shunning it mm-hmm. but when you went to Liberty uh you you guys had these things called convocations and I'll let you explain what that is but every convocation that you attended also had interpreters. And so not only were the deaf mm-hmm. students allowed to sit in the interpreter section, but the students that were taking sign language courses were also able to do that so that they would get more sign language practice and exposure. And I just, I, the, the yes. difference between hiding us in a dungeon and bringing everyone out into these <laughs> big events, it's night and day. Right. Yeah, no, it was really cool and wild um to have the experience that I that we got to have there because yeah so like Liberty is for people who don't know is like one of the biggest Christian universities I think in the world um and so three times a week we had this thing called convocation where we had to go and sit and we did like school-wide announcements and then like worship songs our campus pastor or president like would come and would like speak for a little bit. And then sometimes we'd have guests that would come and speak. Um, And it was really cool when I like first started at Liberty, it started to get like kind of political my second year there and kind of degraded from there. But like the sign language part of it was always really fun because like, yeah, we were required. Everyone that goes there is required to sit with their hall. Your RA has to do attendance to make sure you're there or whatever. And so like, you're supposed to sit with your hall and it's supposed to also like encourage bonding with your hall and friendships and stuff like that um 
but we didn't because we wanted to sit with where the interpreters were. Um, and so if you were studying sign language, you could tell your RA, I mean, like they had, you had to show like, Hey, I am in this class. I'm not just going over there. Um, <laughs> but would be like hey hi please I'm gonna go sit over there now and so they'd be like okay you're here go and so you'd go and sit down and you were just surrounded by a bunch of other students I'd probably say there was maybe five rows of us that we would sit kind of sporadically in um so maybe like 20 30 kids every convo that are like students deaf themselves that need the interpreter because we saved the first row for like our professors that were deaf that needed the interpreters or the deaf students that went to Liberty that were there to have the interpreters there but like also all of the interpreting students got to sit and watch interpreters work for the four years that we were there and it also helped us get to know the interpreters very well like even if we weren't seeing them out on events and stuff um so it was really cool way to engage and just be like oh like I might not have a deaf student in any of my gen ed or other like outside of ASL classes to watch ever. But I know at least three times a week, I can come sit here and watch an interpreter work and try to wrap my brain around how they do what they do. So were there a lot of deaf students at your school? We had, let me think, two, three, four. I think we probably had five or six the whole time I was there. And then, like, by the time I was graduating, I know there was, like, a few newer ones that I didn't know as well, and some of the ones had graduated and stuff like that. So there was always about, I would say, six, maybe seven kids that were there at any given moment that used the interpreters for a combo. Those are the ones that we saw three mm-hmm. times a week. There were some that just wouldn't, that lived off campus that didn't come to convocation or, you. you know, right. whatever reason they weren't there, but. Big university, middle, little. He, well, I don't know. I, I don't have a good frame of reference. I'm from a very small town, but <laughs> I think residentially they have, I want to, I don't, this might be the wrong number, but I want to say they have 15,000 students residentially. It was a very, it, was, it felt so like, like a huge university. students isn't a significant chunk. <laughs> right, no. <laughs> so it was, it was more, there were more interpreting students than there were yes. deaf students. Deaf students, okay. yes. Okay. So, as a whole was the university really supportive of the program or was it something that they were like we don't really understand this but we're going for it um I would say within the modern language department people were very supportive of having it and like our department had our back a lot I would say as a whole the student body and or elders in the university or whatever probably knew we existed maybe but didn't really understand why we were there or like what we were doing um but I will say like I know for we would sometimes have convocations just within our department instead of like the entire university so like when modern languages would do their convocations sometimes our deaf professors would be the ones that would present and they would present in sign language and the interpreters would be sitting in front of them in the audience but voicing for them um and so our department seemed very supportive of it. And there was like kind of the like, you know, we're having deaf socials or like deaf lunch or dinner or whatever. Um, and everyone's like walking past the Starbucks going like, oh, it's all of those signing <laughs> people. They're all doing their thing. <laughs> or like by the time you get into like the third and fourth year of your program, you know, like you're wearing interpreter attire. I have not changed from work. Um, <laughs> And, you know, it's like the kids are just like, wow, these are the kids that look like they're going to a funeral every day of their life. You know, I hope they're okay. My language kids were the goth kids of campus. We were. (laughs) So, so it was, it was more of a, a confusion and a befuddlement than it was like, there wasn't any sort of anger towards or any discrimination against, you know, either the deaf Mm -hmm. students or the interpreting students. I wouldn't say so. I feel like, you know, sometimes there was still an aspect of making sure interpreters were there for things. I'm trying to think. I feel like as a whole, though, the university did a pretty decent job. I know I had not that I've ever watched any of it, but like the big church that's connected to Liberty is uh, Thomas Road Baptist Church. And they're like a huge mega church or whatever. I don't know. Um, They've for years like 
in the 2000s, maybe in the 1990s, like they've always had in the bottom right corner of their TV programs when they like stream church or whatever, they've always had an interpreter in the box interpreting. So like they've, I don't know why or how that got started, but they've always had like an interpreter presence from my understanding. Cause I I remember being in school. Yeah. Like I can remember being at, at Liberty and like watching old TRBC videos and it's like really grainy, but like there is like, there's the little interpreter there in the box. So like, it always felt like they've been pretty good about that. And I would say like, as a whole event wise, whether that be the university had it set up or the interpreters and the deaf students were advocating for it, I don't know, but there was almost always interpreters at all the events we, we had. That's awesome. <laughs> Yeah. (laughs) Other than convocation, um, your classes, were they, because it was a whole graduate program, were they huge classes? Were they smaller classes? Did you get a lot of work outside of the classroom in terms of like, as you got later into the program? Um, I would say they were relatively small classes. I'm trying to think of how big my 101 class was, because that was the biggest one. There was probably... 20 25 of us in my ASL 101 class which is small big depends on your program but like some of my gen eds you know we would have 400 500 students sitting in like an amphitheater um yeah yeah no thank you <laughs> no thank you um so it felt very small comparatively and of course again same thing as you work your way through the program people drop off people are like oh this is a cool language and they do what I want and you walk in and first day of class the the teacher's like I can't talk and you don't know my language so we have to figure this out (laughs) and that's why you're here you can't speak in this class and it's like oh no there's no interpreters you have to figure this out (laughs) yes yeah we we in our classes at the 101 level, you got one day where he would put in his hearing aids and he would mm-hmm. turn them on and he would voice because he was very good at voicing. And after that first day where he laid down the rules for how things are going to work and he kind of gave you some very, very basics, he said, okay, the rest of it, we're either signing or you're using your body to convey the message. And I'm not yep. going to yell at you if it's not pure sign language because obviously you don't know it yet. Right. You have to try to use your body. And if we all get frustrated, we can write it on the whiteboard or draw <laughs> it on the whiteboard or do mm-hmm. a little dance. We got a little scuba diving dance a couple of times, which was hilarious and dangerous. But your voice was not something that you were to ever use. <laughs> right. Yeah, I know for sure. It is. It was, yeah, it was definitely a a wild experience, one that I cherished. And it was fun to go into that and be like, oh, from the like three years that I had been studying by myself in in high school, like trying to Mm. teach the language, I had a decent, I I, I had my foot under me. Like I was following Mm. with the teacher, was still learning because while I learned online and did know a lot, a lot of the signs I learned that were online were older signs or were signs Ah. that are very specific to California. Um, (laughs) And compared regionally, like over here on the East Coast, like Virginia, we have a very different signing style than from the West Coast. Oh, and yeah. so <laughs> you and I sometimes oh, oh, yeah. look at each other going, what did you just say? What? <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's one thing people don't recognize is that sign language is has its own dialects and regions, just mm-hmm. like speaking styles. Uh, you know, every so often when I speak, I sometimes either sound Canadian or very Southern. And I don't know why. I have no reason uh-huh. to do that, but I do. And you can do the same thing in sign language. You know, Kansas, I got, you know, watch that Switch at Birth show. Kansas has its mm-hmm. own very strong dialect. You and I, West Coast differences, city yeah. versus urban, you know, older generations versus younger generations. Yes. It's, it's, it's not all exactly the same and it doesn't all directly translate to English, which people also don't realize. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And it's very fun to juggle all of that, especially like learning. Yes. But like, even now in my job, like I kind of have to, we'll get into it more later, I'm sure. But like with my job, I cover, I work with people across the entire nation. So it's like, oh, I have to look to see where they are. Cause like in that second, it's like, okay, you're in Texas gauging how old you are. Okay. Like I have to kind of change my style to match theirs. Cause like, this is grass in most signed places, but in Texas, this is a sign for truck. And it's like, oh, really? why? We don't know. Yeah. Okay. And so there's like the regional <laughs> variants there can be really fun or like, what's your sign for chicken or what was the sign that you learned for chicken? Like that you chicken. eat. 
Chicken. Oh, yeah, chicken. Yeah. Yeah, chicken. Um, Chicken or chicken are the most common in Virginia. It's for bird. So this had to be chicken because of the, the, yeah. The pecking. Um, In Virginia, this is a very common regional sign for chicken is chicken. And so when I started working with deaf students, they would often be like, oh, I want a chicken sandwich. And I'm like, a what now? What? <laughs> a, a what? <laughs> and was like out of the loop because my professors are wonderful, but none of them are Virginia natives. The ones that I that I taught with, they've all just kind of moved here. Um, and so like, I'm sure like if you signed this to one of them, they would know that was chicken. But when they were teaching us, we did learn chicken or chicken um, typically. So the first time I saw chicken as an interpreter, I was like, I don't, I cannot comprehend what this could mean. It's not turkey. It's not chicken. What is it? <laughs> Well, or like so. places. So um, I'm from. I, I I'm not from, but I took. I did school and I learned sign language in Ashland, Oregon. And so their sign for Ashland was just this. Ashland. Oh, that's funny. And I'm like, okay. And then they'd talk about Portland, Oregon. You know, oh, I'm gonna go up to <laughs> Portland, and it was just P Town. Like, <laughs> I would have signed Portland. Right. So I'm like, so and 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 people in Portland would sign it Portland. Yeah, in Ashland. We had to go P town. We we cool. Like, Stop. You're not cool. <laughs> but yeah, so it's just like so many things. Like mm-hmm. some of Portland would come down and they would sign with us, and they're like, "What is wrong with you guys? What is wrong with Ashland?" <laughs> right. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, so if I recall correctly, um, as part of your program, you did spend. Uh, you went to visit Gallaudet University. Yes, we did. Tell us I about think that. Yeah, it was super first cool. First, Gallaudet is, and then yes. we'll talk about. <laughs> <laughs> so Gallaudet, uh, Gallaudet is the name sign for Gallaudet. Um, is the biggest uh, university for deaf students in the nation. Um, it is not the only one. Um, and I, I say one of the biggest, cause I know it was at one point the biggest, but I know Rochester Insti- technical Institute for the deaf in New York is like also pretty dang huge. I'm not mm-hmm. sure which is bigger right now, but Gallaudet is the more well-known one, um, to go there for your bachelor's or master's. You have to have a grasp in sign language because you walk on campus and everyone is signing. Um, there's not, I mean, like you could maybe voice and try to be like, hi help but like if you're not supporting it with signs like you're not going to get very far in campus you're not going to get accepted there part of the acceptance policy or not policy but like process is you have to do like a signed interview um so or at least last time when I looked at it um but yeah so they're super cool it's named after Thomas Gallaudet who was one of the people that helped bring ASL or bring sign language to America um, alongside Lauren Clerk uh, way back in the day. So uh, yeah, so we got to go and visit. It was super cool. We didn't get to go. I think like when we went, a lot of the people were on break, which like maybe was for the better, like less overwhelming for us. But um, we got to at least go see the architecture, which was one of the coolest parts of the trip because the entire college and university is designed with deaf people in mind so like all of the wood that like I know that like one of the bigger areas they had this like giant bench that had wood that wrapped up and warped onto like one of the walls and like architecturally like absolutely beautiful but all of the wood was very hollow so that if you knocked on any portion of it the vibrations would carry so you could get somebody's attention that's amazing and that's like super freaking cool all of the elevators are glass elevators or at least the ones in the building like that we toured were and so like we were like having conversations on the second and third and fourth floor and it's like very visually easy to see people from great distances and have conversations which is like really cool and useful (laughs) when almost all of your population there is going to be signing and stuff like that so it was really cool to go and see the architecture and thought that was put in and like the closer you get to Gallaudet in DC all of the, I mean, like, I'm sure most of the, like, stoplights and, like, the cross guards, um, like, you have to push the button and the things, like, don't walk or walk, they'll start, you know, flashing more and have more lights and there's a lot more signs that say, like, warning, like, deaf crossing or, like, there's deaf people around, like, be more careful and it becomes a lot more deaf and deaf blind friendly, um, which is super cool and, like, yeah, I don't know. The architecture when we went was like one of the coolest things that we got to see alongside like there's so many different statues and murals and deaf art there that's just beyond gorgeous. So it was a super cool experience. Awesome. Yeah. 
So you take all your courses, mm -hmm. you visit and tour Gallaudet, and then you graduate. And then what happens? <laughs> you sit there and you flail and you go, oh gosh, what's next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you go through all of your ASL classes, all of your interpreting classes. We did have to do a practicum as like one of the last mm -hmm. things we did, which helped because that's like, I want to say it was a hundred and... 30 or 20 hours and it had to be with nationally certified interpreters um so you're, and it was you're job shadowing yes mm -hmm. um and it was only like time that they spent like hands up actually interpreting or voicing that we could count in our hours mm -hmm. so it was incredibly hard to get um because interpreters are very busy and like they have to clear it you know they have to accept like yes you can come with me but for that to happen they have to ask their clients to be like are you cool with like a kid sitting in the background watching us as this happens as you're trying to go about your life um right. and so obviously like a lot of them would say no to that um which is totally fair and fine. So oh, yeah. we did do that. That helped put me in contact with a bunch of really amazing interpreters though in my area um, and in the surrounding states. One of which was kind of my mentor while I was um, doing practicum with her. Her name was Ivy. And she, as I got closer to getting to the point where I would be entering to where I needed an internship, an actual job, um, <clears throat> she was like, hey, you should apply at the company I work for. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> and she's like, yeah, 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 I think you'd do great. It's mostly video relay interpreting, which is interpreting phone calls for the deaf. And it's basically where like a deaf person picks up their, you know, clicks onto their video phone and it's like, I'm going to call my mother, let's say, who doesn't sign. Um, and it's like, okay. So they click dial and then on the interpreter's end, a screen pops up. We click accept and we can see the deaf person and it's like, hey, how are you? Are you ready to call? So then we click dial on our end and call the hearing person. So we can now hear them in our ear while seeing the deaf person and we relay back and forth from there, um, which I had heard about and knew some about. And some of my professors did VRS interpreting. And I was like, I don't, I don't think I can do that, though. Like, I'm probably not like good enough at a job to do that as the first thing I do as an interpreter. And I was like, I don't know. It's fine. You're fine. Just let's just come try. And so I sat for an interview with the company I work for, Purple. Um, I got the interview. Like, they offered me the job on the uh, promise that, like, I would take their entry exam or whatever. Like, you have to basically do a couple of interpreted vignettes and they see how well you can interpret. So I did that. They were really impressed. And so they hired me without having graduated yet, <laughs> without ever having a real job. I was insanely surprised that they hired me. Um but they did. And so I did my internship there and my internship was just, you know, working and getting paid to be interpreting. And it just counted as my internship hours. And I've been working there ever since. Um, but that's not necessarily a common experience. <laughs> I don't know how I lucked out and got all that. <laughs> so, so other than getting your bachelor's degree, right? Was mm -hmm. there, that was the only thing you needed to do to be an interpreter. Was there any certifications or anything like that that you had to go through? We, you don't necessarily even need your bachelor's to interpret, depending on your state's regulations and rules. Um, in Virginia, we have the Virginia Quality Assurance Screening, the VQAS, that you can go and take. And there is a knowledge portion where you answer a bunch of questions about the interpreter's code of ethics and just seeing, like, morally, do you know what is right and wrong in our job? Um, and if you pass that, you take the performance, which is signing and voicing um and doing interactive vignettes for a myriad of different things and you get levels i think it's one through four um on for like pure asl side of it and more english leaning side of it um not necessarily like strict c but more like pigeon sign english or just like more english leaning signs um and so you ha we have to take that as a part of our degree to graduate you have to get ah at least a two in one of the sides to pass um and, and like that's the third year i think of the program so if you don't do that <laughs> you're kind of screwed <laughs> um so is that so virginia requires that do you know how many of the other states have similar requirements or is it more of a less strict sort of thing 
It depends. I don't know off the top of my head how many states have their version of it. I know there's the VQAS. The BEI is Texas's version of a certification screening, but it's a lot higher level than like the VQAS is. Like people will almost accept that at the same criteria that they'll accept a national certification for interpreting the NIC. Um, so I know like those are the two really big ones, but then there's like the VQAS. I know, I think North Carolina has some sort of test that you can take. I'm sure New York and Pennsylvania do, but then there's some states that have like nothing. Like I think Florida doesn't have one. I might be misremembering that, but there's like a couple of states that like don't have any requirements. And it's like, if you can kind of prove to whoever's hiring you that, you know, sign language, you might get the job, but that gets really iffy when the person hiring you doesn't know sign language and takes you on fact. It's like, well, you seem like, you know what you're doing. And then you have really unqualified interpreters that are trying to interpret and it can get really sticky, which is how we end up with messes that many people have seen on the news where you have interpreters standing next to really famous people or presidents or whatever, and they're are not signing they might look like You're they are but they are Nelson not signing Mandela's funeral aren't you <laughs> that's one of the bigger ones that's happened yep yeah. <laughs> literally so for those who don't know who didn't hear it during Nelson Mandela's funeral a unvetted and absolutely unqualified person yep offered their services as an interpreter and was allowed to stand next to the then president of the United States to interpret and I don't know if there was ever a background check on this person, let alone anything that assured people that he knew sign language, because the people right. who were deaf and knew sign language were basically like, he's just flapping his hands around. <laughs> There's no yeah. words here. <laughs> and it's, it was just an absolute, it was, it was disappointing doesn't even cover it it was just shameful the whole situation it was and it's not it happens so frequently this is this is something i really want to stress is because there really isn't a national standard requirement mm -hmm. anybody could just i mean i with the small amount of sign language and small amount of fluency i have i could walk up and go oh i'm an interpreter and mm -hmm. nobody really would know any different other than people who are actually better at signing than i am it's it's bizarre you know most i mean if it, it would be like having a doctor who's like yeah I, mm -hmm. i've used knives before i could do surgery and you're like exactly don't, don't. <laughs> <laughs> so it's there's it, very there for for accessibility which is super important so we have the uh, the americans with disabilities act and it says you know disabled folks need to have proper accessibility for mobility and sight and hearing and etc mm -hmm. um there's the the act exists, the rule exists, but the enforcement and the details of the enforcement of those acts are not necessarily spelled out or clarified. And so right. you get into situations where, okay, we tell television networks we have to have closed captioning, and then mm -hmm. we don't have any official standards for the quality of closed captioning. So then you get right. news uh news outlets or sports outlets that just key smash and call that accessibility and it's not you know right. the same happens for actual interpreters where you don't always know the quality of someone unless they have gotten these optional uh, mm -hmm. certifications which is just <laughs> mind-blowing <laughs> yeah <laughs> so you yeah. so you got your certification you you it was not necessarily optional for you but you you got it and right. you got signed into Purple, which is the, the company that you work for, and you started working. And how long have you been there? Uh, I've been there, let's see, what month is it? It's January. I've been there a little over three years. Yeah. <laughs> what is it like? So, so, so we mentioned earlier your, your outfit. You, you haven't worked out of your, your, your clothes. You haven't changed mm -hmm. out of your clothes for work. Right. Um, for those who don't understand why interpreters have to dress like goth kids, what's the reasoning <laughs> behind that? Yeah, so I have very fair, light-colored skin. I am white. Um, so uh, to easily see my hands, because, you know, if I'm 
Huh, sim coming is really hard but like if I were to be signing right now as I'm speaking you know you would want to be able to see my hands very clearly as they're moving and if I'm to move over and I start doing this in front of my wall behind me which is very white it becomes very hard to see that um that would be magnified by 10 if behind me was like a plaid wall or a striped wall or whatever if there was any kind of pattern it would become very hard to see my hands um so because i do have fair skin i wear darker color clothing to contrast against my hands so that you can see them more clearly while i'm signing it's also why i keep something on my arms because there are signs that you do like hospital that are on your arm or whatever so if there was nothing here and i was just doing hospital on my own skin it would be kind of hard to see my fingers and what shape they're in so that can be really important because the smallest little thing no can change a sign on your shirt too it's it's mm -hmm. you no know, there's no logos there's no drawings it's right it's blank so it's just everything is in terms of visibility that's also why uh you don't wear as much jewelry on your hands or yes. uh your necklaces mm -hmm. I have a right like you, the only mm -hmm. um so during the pandemic, we've actually seen more and more interpreters on the screen, um, which is amazing yes. and exciting because this was this is a battle mm -hmm. that's been, oh, please, please, please get us interpreters in emergency news conferences. And yay, we've got right. a lot of them now. We don't quite have them in the White House yet, but okay. Soon, we'll hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> but that's another thing. But I have been noticing male interpreters with mm -hmm. big, big beards and I yes. thought I was under the assumption that that was a no-no because um mustaches and beards cover the facial expressions especially of the lips so is that is that kind of a how does that work <laughs> it's a little sticky they they do and you're gonna have deaf people that are like you have anything but like the cleanest of shaven of chins and I will throw you out of the room you can't interpret for me because people are can be that way about their language access um and you're gonna have people that are gonna be like you could have the longest beard in the world I don't care and you run the gamut with clients um traditionally like in my program again like we had a very strict program to be fair but we weren't allowed the guys the few guys we had weren't allowed to have big bushy beards because you do want to be able to lip read and mm -hmm. see facial grammar um but i'm trying to think i know i'm trying to think of the guys that work in my center which there's again not very many of i think there's only one guy in my center that has like a bigger beard but even then his isn't you know probably but like that big it's not like mm -hmm. super bushy right okay interesting yeah so are these are these more like you know how like in pirates of the caribbean it's like eh, it's not exactly rules it's just like guidelines <laughs> is interpreter dress code kind of like that or do some places really do have a you will not work if you do not dress like this um i think it depends which is the fun you know it depends that's the catch-all answer with anything with interpreting um i think it's georgia i want to say maybe misquoting that so don't quote me but I, I feel like it was georgia that our professor told us in college like any interpreter that wears any shade of red will get thrown out of a room because mm. like i wear i will wear burgundy or like a dark maroon i think is a red um and usually we'll wear a black blazer or something on top of it but even I have worn just a red shirt to work as long as it's a dark red that's still I feel like I can be seen visibly with my hands um have never really gotten a complaint at work and I do work with people across the nation um but I, there are I've heard of places where it's like no you cannot wear anything but it's more guidelines it's more matching your client knowing who your client is like today this is I mean you can't really see my pants I'm just in slacks but like this is fairly relaxed I'm just wearing a dress with slacks I worked virtually today not at VRS but I interpreted for a school that is still doing virtual learning and interpreted at a school all day um so I'm pretty relaxed I don't have on a really nice blazer or anything like that if I'm to go into the office I'm usually wearing something that comes up this high maybe a little bit higher on my neck because we do have people that are not necessarily full deaf blind but people that have very hard vision problems and that are also deaf that need a higher contrast to be able to see signs more clearly um so i try to wear stuff that is more widely accepted since i don't know who i'm working with at any given moment of any given day and where they may be in the country so i, I try to wear more darker clothes since i work with that but some of my coworkers don't i have coworkers that show up in jeans i have coworkers that you know aren't as 
you know, strict following. I think just because of how Liberty's program was, I tend to fall more on the like more professional side of it. And that's fine. But I think you kind of run the gamut with interpreters, just like you do with clients. Okay. So when you work, typically, if you're not like on an assignment at like a school or like a hospital or anything, Mm -hmm. uh, you go into the office for your company Mm -hmm. and you work with many different interpreters uh what does Mm -hmm. that look like do you guys work together is it always one interpreter by themselves do you have little cubicles do you have Mm -hmm. big rooms do you have headsets what (laughs) yeah so we have we do have cubicles we all work in the same room but the room has many cubicles all set up beside each other when we go into work and sit down to start our day we are all working by ourselves and answering calls and interpreting by ourselves but we always do have the option to call for a team to come sit with us if it's a high stress call if it's very high uh terminology or jargon or lingo or anything like that a very high register if you're stuck and you don't know what's happening maybe you don't understand the caller that happens maybe you need a second set of eyes because it's technology and it can get really freezy and glitchy and somebody doesn't have great signal, but they're trying to communicate something and gosh darn it, you're trying to match. Um, so we have the option to call for a team, but yes, we usually sit in a cubicle in our chairs. Um, we have one monitor that has a really high quality camera and headsets and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, we usually start our day in our cubicles and if we need a team, we can call for one or we can go and help other people if they need help. But we are all, yeah, in the same room together. <laughs> so, um, it came out of my head. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> uh, okay, the types of, the types of, so um, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you could be interpreting just a phone call from a person to their mother. What other mm-hmm. kinds of uh things do you interpret so many so many things anything that you could imagine being happening on a phone in outside of the deaf world like in the real world even though it's still a real world but like anything that you could think of calling for I've probably interpreted for um you have people that are calling family members you have people that are calling to like order a pizza or to order dinner because you have to order food. They have to order food. It comes through an interpreter. We do that. Um, You have people like opposite ends that are calling their lawyers to talk about court cases that they're going through just like a hearing person would, but because they're deaf, they have to have an interpreter. So we interpret that. We do interpret 911 calls. And because of the nature of our job, we have to be able to see our clients to see them signing. So we can usually see what's happening on screen during 911 calls, which can get to be very stressful. You have people that are calling to tell their mom that they found out they're pregnant you have people like anything that you could imagine being happening over the phone we tend to do with the pandemic and everything being virtual now we also are doing our fair share like we used to do a lot but now even more of conference calls and business meetings and school classes are now online and depending on what platform they use it might come through us and stuff like that so yeah I think that's that's something that we, we talk about, to get really serious for a moment, we talk about during the pandemic, you know, a lot of the first responders who have gone through their share of stress and PTSD um, in, in dealing with so many situations that have come alongside the pandemic. And I think most people don't recognize that, I mean, I would consider interpreters of any language, and that would include ASL as first responders in a sense because mm-hmm. you're, you're often sort of working alongside them, especially in emergency calls and, and 911 calls. Um, and there's a lot of things that, you know, in court cases or emergency calls, you you can't talk about these things. You know, right. You can't come home at the end of the day and go to your significant other and just tell them all about the calls you've had. You cannot do that because that it's a breach of privacy. Mm-hmm. Um So when you get stressful calls, when you go through some of these things and you can't talk about it, what, what do interpreters do? How, where do interpreters go for support? Yeah. Um, well, I personally have a really lovely, amazing therapist that I would not still be functioning if I did not have. Um, I, she often calls us like interpreters as a group, like first and a half responders, because we are, 
you know, face to face with whatever is happening and any language comes through us. And like, yes, it's not necessarily happening to me um, per se. I'm not in the room where it's happening, but I am expressing it to the same extent that the deaf caller is expressing it. So if somebody hypothetically, like, I don't know, has like a stab wound in their arm or something, um, they're obviously in a lot of pain. They're probably yelling. They're, you know, very high stress I have to convey that in my voice because that's how they're acting when I am voicing for them to the hearing person. That's very important in medical terms just because of like knowing rate of pain and stuff like that. You're, you lose some of that context, but anyways, um, because it comes through us. Yeah. It's, yeah, you know, it's it's an interpreter is not <clears throat> doing a monotone voice when they're using a voice for a deaf person. It's like, oh, I'm so mad at you. I hate your guts. You know, it's you 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 may end right. up having to be acting out a screaming match because yeah. that is what the job is requiring you to do. Exactly, and so because of that, y- you do have to an extent a lot of like vicarious trauma that happens with calls, just because like yes, you're not the one that got stabbed in the arm, but you're screaming as if it was you and your body, our brains are very cool and smart things, but they're very dumb sometimes. And it's like, I know you're not the one that's hurt, but you're acting like you are. So it makes your stress hormones go up. Um, So it is a very stressful thing. So a lot of us do have therapists. Um, Usually in those higher stress calls, we are working with a team interpreter because Mm. you want a second set of eyes, hands, anything to help. Um, 911 calls, we automatically have to have somebody sitting with us. Um, So usually after the call is over, you set away from your computer and let the system chill and turn and try to debrief with your team and just Mm -hmm. be like, oh my God, that was insane. What the hell just happened? Let's talk about this. Are you okay? Am I okay? Do we need to go for a walk together? And like, you have that. A moment to check in and and breathe which is very important um, and very good to do. So you have that. If you, for whatever reason, don't have a team in that moment, our supervisors are, we're always allowed to like go into their office and be like, hi, can I close the door? Something happened. I need to chat with somebody. And they're, we're allowed to talk to them about it because um, we do have very strict confidentiality rules um, as part of our job. So yes, it is very hard. Um, I also... I I try to debrief at work when I can. I try to go for walks uh, and meditate. And when I get home, I try to, I like, I'm a runner. I love to run. So I try to work out some of my stress via running or art or stuff like that. But it is, it's a very hard job and a very hard burden sometimes, especially when you are sometimes literally dealing with life and death situations. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, there's probably things that you're just so glad to have also kind of sort of in a way be a part of too, right? Oh yeah, 1000%. And there's like so many things that I can't talk about because again, confidentiality, but like some of the things that I've gotten to interpret for and the realms of, you know, like businesses or fields or like just different things that I've gotten to, you know, sit and it's just like, oh, this is like, A, just super really cool to be doing, but like B, really fun in a way as an interpreter to figure out like language wise, how I'm going to take this very English thought concept idea or whatever and change it into something that will make sense in ASL to my deaf client. There's something that can be very fun and creative about that process, depending on what you're interpreting. And so like, that's always really cool. It is always really cool when somebody's like, oh my gosh, mom, I'm pregnant or like has really good news that they're sharing or stuff like that. Uh, excuse me, that it's really cool to be a part of those small moments and people are like, oh, in like an ideal world, nobody would even know the interpreter was there. And like, maybe yes, but like we are still there. We're not robots. And so right. it's, it is always, it, it is, it is cool to be a part of those moments. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a, you get to, it's, it's a really interesting way to, to see into people's everyday lives. Mm-hmm. So, um, let's see. Thinking, thinking, thinking. I'm buffering quite a bit. Um, let's see. That's I, had okay. a good, I had a good question and it's totally gone. <laughs> um, okay. So you at the beginning, uh, your, your mentor goes, oh, you should check out my company and VRS uh, possibilities. Mm-hmm. And you were nervous because you're like, oh, I don't know if I'm good enough for that. Oh, I don't know if I'm ready for that. And 
you do VRS and then you you do do in, in person interpreting or pre pandemic. Yes, you know. And but did did VRS become a favorite for you, or is it in person program uh, interpreting that's a favorite, or is it all about equal <laughs> at this point? Because they're different. I don't know. But do they feel different? They are. They do. Um, I would say at this moment in time, I think I've kind of flip flopped as I've been in my career. The pandemic has made our VRS jobs a lot more stressful and harder than normal as the pandemic has affected most people's day-to-day lives. Um, It's just kind of compounded in VRS. So right now I much prefer in-person interpreting um, or even the virtual side of that in some way, shape, or form. I like how do I put this? I have really, really bad social anxiety. Um, and so for whatever reason, if something is more business oriented or medical or the kinds of things that you're normally going to have an in-person interpreter for, I can wrap my head around it. And it's like, okay, we are here because a child needs access to his education. I can interpret that. We are here to interpret an IEP meeting, to interpret a business meeting, to, be here for the next 12 hours in this hospital to see what happens with like whatever this person's care is I can do that the more like familial relational stuff that we get in VRS sometimes between like mother and son or best friends and stuff like that is really fun but it's also very stressful for me just because I do have really bad social anxiety and I don't know why that sets it (laughs) off but it does um So I think I probably prefer in-person interpreting, plus you don't have to worry about technical difficulties or glitches or freezing things. Um, It's a lot easier to do your job. It's a lot easier for an interpreter to do their job when both parties can see each other because they're not typically going to they can see when the other person is speaking and will wait for you to finish you know sometimes on the phone especially some representatives that may have no clue what ASL is or what an interpreter is they will interrupt or will talk over you and it's like I am signing as they're speaking and I'm voicing and I am somehow working in two languages at once and my brain is going 80 miles per hour one of you needs to stop for a second (laughs) (laughs) now are you able to tell a client not not necessarily your deaf client but the hearing client are you allowed to tell them wait I'm not let me finish this portion so I can do this right Right. Yeah. Cause like all of the interpreting that I do for the most part is simultaneous. So as somebody is saying something, I'm signing it and vice versa. Um, so coming a lot. Not as no? I'm not the one speaking. I'm okay, not usually okay. signing what I'm speaking. So if the hearing okay, person. Okay. I was like, that seems really weird for you to be the one. That- <laughs> <laughs> no, no. That's incoming. Um, simultaneous. There's a difference between simultaneous interpreting and thought out of head I can't think of the specific word that they use for the other one but it's like delayed interpreting um non-simultaneous is like a lot of language interpreters especially like uh spoken language interpreters like French or maybe Spanish or I don't know a lot of them will like listen to somebody in like political situations let's say um and they'll sit and they'll let somebody get five sentences in a paragraph and two paragraphs into a thought and they make shorthand notes and then that person stops speaking and then they do all of the Spanish or French or whatever language interpretation from there based off their notes. We learned how to do this in our program but it is not feasible it is not easily feasible with sign language because it is hands up not spoken so it's hard to make notes (laughs) notes <laughs> about what is happening when the language you're writing in is not the same as the language that <laughs> you're seeing right. um so we do what is considered simultaneous interpreting which is when if somebody is speaking you are signing if somebody is signing you are speaking for them at the same time that they are speaking so i might mm-hmm. you know lag behind a couple of words or a sentence to get thoughts or concepts to make sure i'm understanding before i put something out and to give my brain time to process to put out better ASL um Mm -hmm. but I'm not letting somebody get two paragraphs ahead of me because my brain can't retain that much information and then interpret and then take in more information at the same time right (coughs) so now do you you exclusively use ASL to interpret right you don't use any of the other versions of signing not we only use uh it gets so like tricky. You don't, you don't interpret in C, do you? 
I mean, if a client grew up and all they ever learned was C, I have to be able to interpret for them and see if that's what okay. they're used to. Okay. So yeah, it, it, it does depend. It depends on how the person grew up, what they learned. I have, we have clients that come up on the phone quite a bit that are like, Hey, like, I need you to sign because like, yes, I am deaf. I am hard of hearing, like whatever I need you to sign, but I specifically lip read and I am very orally trained. So I need you to put everything that you can on your lips and make it more pronounced than you normally would. Cause like, if I'm interpreting, I'm going to be mouthing parts of the words as well as some grammar and stuff like that in sign language are mouth as well. Um, so I'm usually doing that and it's pretty normal to speaking, but if somebody is speaking and I'm interpreting for somebody that grew up lip reading, my lip movements are going to become, I can't do it and speak at the same time, but they're going to become a lot more pronounced. So the person is more easily able to read my lips. Um, okay. so it depends. Okay. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so Let's see. So to wrap it up a little bit, um, it's it's a tough job. It's yes. it's it's got it's got some some tough things you have to do, but it's very rewarding. Um, the demand for the job is this a job where it's there's a lot of competition to get the jobs, or are there so many jobs available because there's not enough interpreters to fill them? More the latter, um, depending on where you're getting hired or if you're freelancing can like make a difference. Like obviously, hopefully the agency that's hiring you is going to make sure that like you can do your job and you can interpret before they hire you. But like if you're able to sign, yeah, I mean like especially this year, like so many, I'm sure not our company alone, but like so many places have just had such a increased need for interpreters, which is amazing. It is so good that people are like, oh, right. That's a thing that we're legally required to do. Maybe we should start doing that. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but it is just, there is such a demand that we that are in our workforce have a hard time meeting to the point where like, we work so much that we're starting to burn ourselves out because there is that much work all of the time out there always. <laughs> and mm -hmm. there, there's, there's not really enough people to fill the, the spaces. Mm -hmm. So don't necessarily go into specifics, but so because mm -hmm. of the fact that it is such an in-demand job, mm -hmm. uh, oh, there you are. <laughs> because Sorry. because it's, it's such an in-demand job, I'm guessing the compensation in terms of salary is pretty mm -hmm. good, right? Because they, they need mm -hmm. to make it worth your while. Yes, usually, yes. Um, you have, I've heard, I've never personally experienced, but I've heard from like other interpreters and read places, some educational institutions or like public schools that don't really know better that are just like oh we have to legally provide you with interpreters but the county is paying you sometimes that pay can get a little iffy um but for the most part as a profession yeah the, the salary is usually pretty decent to compensate for the knowledge and skill and everything that is required for you to simply like a do your job and b do it well so as, as someone who works with a company, you probably get all kinds of like healthcare benefits and things mm -hmm. like that. Now yeah. is, do most or all interpreters work with companies or do some people freelance or mm -hmm. are there smaller like agencies? How is, yes. it, is it always kind of? I would say it depends um, for the most part. I don't know. It's hard to say. I feel like out of the interpreters that I know outside of my job, most of them freelance to some capacity. Um, if they work for an agency, they also will freelance and do jobs for the state or for people that they know that are deaf clients that need interpreters. So like freelancing is a huge portion of our field. Um, there are quite a lot of agencies um, if people are, you know, like looking at doing this and are able to do this and able to learn how to become an interpreter and X, Y, Z and start looking at agencies, I would, you know, read up on the agencies and make sure they're reputable because there are unfortunately some that maybe don't always have deaf people in mind or don't know their stuff and are hiring unqualified interpreters. So it's like knowing your worth and finding a company that will respect that um, is pretty important. But yeah, so there, there's a lot of agencies there's a lot of people that just do freelance. There's a lot of people like myself that just work inside of an agency because taxes are hard. And it's nice to have somebody like <laughs> do the contract and invoice side of it for you. Right. Um, 
but yeah, I would say you, it, it depends on where you want to go and what focus you want to do. Um, but you kind of run the gamut there. So people who are good at interpreting, what kind of people are they? I mean, I'm, I'm, I would imagine that if you are good at multitasking, you are probably mm-hmm. going to stay, you're going to have a better chance of being a better interpreter than somebody who's like, oh no, I can't multitask. But what kind <laughs> of other, other types yeah. of people or personalities or skills that you pick up help you on your path to becoming an interpreter? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say multitasking is a good one to know, like, if you feel like you are a decent multitasker, you might be a decent interpreter. Uh, One of the cooler exercises we did, I think it was like the end of our second or beginning of the third year of my program was um, somebody, I'm trying to remember exactly how it went. It wasn't anything in sign language yet. We were just doing it in English, but it was like you were listening to somebody read a story aloud and you had to wait 10 seconds before you could start saying what they were saying. So like from the beginning. So it was like almost like a row, row, row your boat situation, except you're waiting 10 seconds and you don't know the lyrics and you're having to remember everything that they said, the way that they said it and getting it out the same way. Um, And it was like our teachers like, fun activity for the entire class but the class was actually like the breaking point for like where you tipped into the major instead of the minor so it was a good way for her to see hey who's able to do this for one who is really struggling because if they're struggling now and they can't learn how to do this they might not be able to be an interpreter down the road and I don't want them to get two more years into this program to figure that out um but yeah being able to multitask I would say enjoying language um I write I like to write I love linguistics linguistics was some of the most fun classes I took in college I love figuring out how language works I like solving problems and like trying to figure out where to put things and stuff like that so like understanding the language side of it and being willing to appreciate that in both like signed and spoken languages is really helpful um A lot of people say you have to be an extrovert to be a good interpreter. I don't think that's true. Most of my friends that are interpreters are introverts. (laughs) I just think you have to have decent people skills because you are obviously working with people and being able to get a good read on people fairly quickly because there is that snap judgment of like, okay, you live in this place. So I need to kind of remember these regional variants. And you're also on the older side, which means you might've grew up, grew up oral and then learned sign language at a later time because of the history of sign language, which we don't have time to get into, Um, but like being able to quickly judge, not judge people, but like quickly gauge where somebody is at on top of being like, oh, you're older. So you might have these misconceptions or preconceived judgments on me as a woman or as a young woman, or, you know, just all of the things that can go into that and like trying to best match somebody because you have to like, A, be their voice, for the deaf person to the hearing person or represent somebody in sign language as they're acting. So you need to be able to like convey that and understand where someone's coming from. So actors, you know, you, you might want to think about sign language. <laughs> yeah. As somebody who did theater all throughout high school, acting yeah. and theater helped me so much in becoming an interpreter. <laughs> yeah. All the, all the actors that took sign language courses when I was in college, they, they they were more confident in expressing themselves um they al- they also had more awareness of their body and mm-hmm. and and spatial spatial skills they they were able yeah. to set things up in a particular space around their body and use their body to convey it and that was something so when i started uh college i was a very monotone person I didn't move my mm-hmm. face a lot I didn't move my hands a lot I I mean if anyone watches <laughs> me in any of these coffee chats or anything I do for the library online or just meet me in real life I'm always wildly exuberant yes uh, that was not me before I started taking my sign language courses I was very much like okay what are we doing oh that's exciting cool well we mm-hmm. can do that, I guess you know and you had to learn to be okay with drawing attention because if you're doing yeah. sign language, people are looking at you. Yes, that was just one of the hardest things to learn. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, so being comfortable with being seen. 
yeah. um, being comfortable with being looked at and, and just being willing to kind of, to be goofy a little bit. That was one mm-hmm. of the things that I struggled the most with was there were, there were facial expressions that I needed to make where I was having to look silly and I was so self-conscious. So like, don't make me look stupid. Don't, yeah. don't ask me to do that. <laughs> you and, have to and, learn and, how to get over yourself very quickly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And it took me a long time. It was hard for me. That was the biggest struggle. Um, and now that I kind of got over that hurdle in terms of sign language courses, I kind of got over that hurdle just in life. And now mm-hmm. I have no problem being kind of weird and out there and like, yeah. ah, you know, that kind of thing. So it's... I love kind of the, the positive side impacts that can come from it. So if you, even if you don't plan on becoming an interpreter, mm-hmm. uh, just knowing the language, just in terms of like your own personal growth. And of course, being able to converse with people in the yes. native language. It's so cool. <laughs> it is because so cool. I promise you, I promise you, like, unless somebody like granted, like we all have bad days, you could walk up to any hearing person on a bad day and they're not going to want to talk to you. Um, mm-hmm. But Almost always, if you know some sign language or are learning sign language and know enough to tell the deaf person, I, I'm learning sign, I know some or I know a little bit, they will want to sit down with you and be like, oh my gosh, like, hi, like, like let's try to figure out how we can communicate. They're typically very happy that somebody is trying to learn their language because unfortunately, and in the history of this country, by and large, hearing people haven't. So when they are able to have somebody that is there that is trying to learn or that knows some and they can converse, and depending on how far you get into learning sign language, they are usually very happy to see somebody. And like, it's such a good marketable skill to have, even if you're not interpreting. Like, mm-hmm. my mother is a nurse. She does not know a lot of sign language, but I have taught her some over the years and I have taught her a lot for medical situations, especially, especially um, enough to get by until an interpreter can get there and stuff like that. I have friends that are teachers that have deaf students that have interpreters in their room, but that have the classes themselves all try to learn sign language together. And the deaf students always feel more included, always typically start doing better in school because they have so many more people around them that are able to communicate. So like, it's just, it's just such a good skill to have regardless of if you want to be an interpreter or not. Right. I, in the library, I was able to, to talk to a patron who wanted to print something and mm-hmm. we didn't have to write back and forth. It was just, we could just sign. And she was just, oh, this is so nice. I can just use the language that I know so I can get to the hard part of using the printer. <laughs> you know, or a barista being able to take an order in sign. You know, it's it's in the yeah. grand scheme of thing, it's it's not necessarily impossible to to do it without signing. But it's just the relief and the ease that there's one less thing in the day that has to be difficult. <laughs> Right. Cause like, and I, I know I speak from a place of like privilege of like being able to hear. Um, but one of the things that we did do in our program was we had these devices. They were almost like hearing aids. Um, they fit inside of your ear and they had a volume knob, but they emitted white noise static Mm -hmm. because they fit into your ear canal. They also blocked most sound from coming into your ear canal. And then the static took away any chance you had at hearing anything else that wasn't extremely loud. Um, and we had to wear them for, I want to say it was two or three days. Um, and we weren't allowed to take them out except for like our other classes, obviously that we didn't have interpreters in. like, you, you can't just be like, I don't know. I can't hear you today. You, you, you had to go to class. For all my classes. <laughs> <laughs> if only didn't have that many interpreters at the school <laughs> but um it was supposed to teach us what it would feel like to go days and learn how to communicate with other people without who didn't know sign language and I can remember at the time I was um not a social butterfly but I had a good small group of friends and I was dating somebody at the time and for those three days it was so hard to be like I want to talk to you and you don't know how to talk to me except for like my roommate who was also a sign language major being able to come home at the end of the day and being able to chat with somebody was the biggest relief or like being able to be walking across campus having not spoken to somebody for hours at this point because I hadn't yet come across somebody who was willing to like 
take the time to write back and forth with me or who knew some sign but like to finally see like the little 101 student across the way and it's like oh hello (laughs) wait a second I can talk to you and it was just two or three days but like the smallest glimpse it really I I cherish that activity because it truly did teach me to be like oh this is deaf people's everyday lives like this is so many more people everybody should know this language and they don't and it is bewildering at this point that more people don't so I encourage everyone to learn sign language even if it's just a little bit like just start just keep just keep going though after Mm -hmm. you just to see if you like it and then just keep going for as long as you want (laughs) right yeah I the same like I just as a person my personality changed so much and so much for the better for mm-hmm. having taken sign language courses and I've gotten to meet so many amazing people like I, I had interpreters that I became friends with through school I had deaf friends that I still am in contact with today I've met people like you because mm-hmm. you know partly because of fandom stuff <laughs> and partly because I like, wait of sign language yeah sign language oh interesting okay there's just there's a, the world of opportunities and the world of people that you can connect with expands so much and it's just mm-hmm. it's an absolute thrill and I love hearing that more and more sign language is being you know taught to kindergartners and first graders and yeah you know some of them can keep going with it and some of them only keep a little bit that they remember but just that that amount of of, of you know visual spatial people it gives them mm-hmm. wait oh this is something that I can really really go for it's just so amazing yes it's so cool and who knows maybe those little kiddos that are like oh this is so much fun to sign maybe they will forget everything and then in high school something will spark interest again and they'll become an interpreter because I probably I would not if if I had not have had the child in my class who was deaf and knew sign language I would not have known about sign language probably until I was much much older wouldn't have really understood what it was or like that it was even an actual language Mm -hmm. um and wouldn't have ever become an interpreter and so like yeah like just the the general the more exposure that people have to it nowadays is really cool to see Mm -hmm. yeah for everyone I I encourage you um even though Holly did start teaching herself online not mm-hmm. the best way to learn sign language. Not. It's you really do Mm-mm. need um, interaction with another human being to either gauge what you're doing or to you know to get to get that feedback. Um, so if you're not going to college for it and you're not necessarily trying to become an interpreter, still maybe like audit a class um, mm-hmm. in college or find um, deaf social events in your area. Yes. Um, if you if you search like Facebook or just even Google or is meetup.com still a thing because they're used to I think. Stuff like that too <laughs> but yeah but try to find deaf social events even if you don't know a single thing in sign language you could probably show up and go I'm willing to learn mm-hmm. help <laughs> teach me yeah. tell me where to go to get resources you know sit with me we'll write back and forth until I get better at this but but definitely don't try to learn sign language in a vacuum try to Mm -hmm. go out and meet people and meet interpreters and meet deaf people and it's 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 a group thing it's 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 not just yes you could you know and i encourage that for all languages but especially especially uh signed languages you can't learn it by yourself for very long there's really for sure yourself And I will say, like, the pandemic obviously has been so crazy and hard on everybody. Like, a weird positive side that's come out of it is, like, ASL is not meant to be an online class kind of thing. Even if it is a live class, it can be kind of hard. Um, But people have had to figure out how to do that because pandemic, like, we can't have in-person schools right now. So, so many people have started figuring out better ways to do ASL in an online class where you have like a deaf teacher teaching you, which is better than like what I was doing of like watching YouTube videos and trying to be like, hmm, this looks like it could be a sign. Um, but <laughs> so many watching YouTube videos done by hearing people who don't actually know oh, the proper signs, yes. which is a problem. Uh, don't just go on YouTube such a problem. and think that every video labeled as a sign language video is actually accurate because usually it's just us hearing kids that have been told to do a song and we're doing it completely wrong and we have no idea how wrong we are (laughs) yeah um but yeah like a lot of places a lot of colleges a lot of schools for the deaf a lot of Mm. different places have started offering asl courses online during the pandemic at a Mm. lower cost because online and 
even if you live in a rural part of town or a rural part of your state, it could still be accessible to you because it is online. Yeah. And so if you have enough of a internet connection to access courses online, you might look into looking at either deaf schools in your area, um, especially like schools that are like you know Washington School for the Deaf or whatever school for the deaf um a lot of them are offering classes now I have a friend that's taking one in I think Pennsylvania um or uh looking to see colleges around you that might be offering online classes that you could potentially audit and have a lower reduced or no cost or if you want to and are able to pay to like sit on one of those classes so right I love it. That's so great. Yeah. So is there anything else that I missed about being an interpreter that you're like, ah, I got to make sure people know about this? Um, I would say my only thing about being an interpreter that I try to tell people when they come to me and are like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. I want to be an interpreter. I'm always like, yes, this is so cool. Being an interpreter is a wild ride don't go into the field lightly um mm. start learning the language if you want to and go as far with the language as you want to go doing this job is incredibly difficult and incredibly hard and mentally taxing so don't go into it being like oh i'll try it and see if it works out for me because if if it doesn't you're gonna have to put in so much work to get nothing to find out that it doesn't um there was a lot of people in our classes that kind of got farther and farther into our program that discovered very late into it that they didn't want to do it or that this was not for them um so this is not something that you can just kind of dip your toe in and be like oh, i'm going to be an interpreter like no it is a lot of hard work to get to the point where you can interpret so don't just go into it lightly do it because you have a passion for it yeah absolutely <laughs> awesome well, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You're welcome. Awesome. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, if you want to learn more about interpreting, um, I'm going to communicate with Holly and see if there's maybe mm -hmm. some links um, that yeah. I can put in the description of this video. And there was, there was a video that we were at the very beginning when you were talking about your journey. Uh, we'll try to, I'll try to figure out what that video was and maybe oh, that yes. link as well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, this was awesome. Uh, if you ever have any questions about interpreting, email me. I'll get a hold of Holly and maybe she can answer them for us. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so until then, this was January's Coffee Chat. Um, I'm hoping that this year of 2021, we got a lot of cool, um, interviews with passionate people coming up um maybe we'll try a couple different things more local people more people from across the states um yeah it's gonna be a surprise to even me so, <laughs> so stay tuned for that all right next time people thank you bye <laughs>